Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour. L'Europe est à la croisée des Europe chemins. Pour certains, la reprise économique est amorcée. The, pour d'autres, la crise continue de faire souffrir les others, économies du continent. Et à sept mois, les élections européennes, les citoyens sont inquiets. European les temps sont durs. Pendant un mois, dans le cadre de l'opération du mois du marché unique de la Commission européenne, des centaines d'Européens ont proposé des solutions pour les sujets qui les touchent. Ils nous touchent l'emploi, bien sûr, les droits sociaux, les banques et la finance. Et enfin, jobs, le commerce électronique, banks, près de 1000 idées ont été avancées, We've had des solutions parfois, ideas put forward, beaucoup de questions aussi. Laurent, on va débattre questions. avec nous, j'ai le plaisir so d'accueillir l'initiateur de ce projet d'échange d'idées avec les citoyens européens, Michel Barnier, Michel Barnier, Michel Barnier le commissaire pour le marché unique et aux services. Monsieur le commissaire, merci d'être avec nous. Bonjour, bonjour et merci d'avoir été ici. Bonjour à tous ceux qui nous suivent grâce à vous. Merci beaucoup. 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 Merci And we always tend to think that we are right, but sometimes we are not. In fact, often we aren't. We do a lot of work, but people have things to say. We can make errors, and we can make mistakes, and so we do have to have confrontations with union representatives, with bankers, with citizens. And we have to concentrate on this last. We have to hold a wider debate with the citizens. As you said, during this debate, we have heard more than a thousand ideas. They're not, they've not all received the same reception, but we've looked at every one of these ideas. And some of these will, of course, be able to go through to produce concrete propositions for European legislation. We have had many charters, we've had many commissioners go through, we've had many MEPs here in Strasbourg, experts who have to now start again. We have to have a public debate around Europe because people are interested and we have to speak to these people. We have to listen to them. Thank you very much. We're going to set up our program in four different chunks. First with jobs, then social rights, banks, and then e-commerce. So how are we going to do this? You've already put forward your questions, but you can still contribute over our social media sites using the hashtag AskBarnier or your ideas for Europe. And here in, at the European Parliament in Strasbourg, we have five web users invited here who are going to present their own ideas and they will be able to put it forward and raise questions and talk to the Commissioner. And here, next to me, we have my colleague Marie Jamais, our Community Manager, who is going to pass on all of the questions raised by web users during the debate. Hello, Commissioner, and good afternoon to everybody. As Fred said, I'm going to be listening to all of you, and please do send in your ideas ideas and questions using the hashtag, hashtag Ask Barnier or hashtag Your Ideas for Europe. Merci Marie. Please do contribute. Mais sans plus tarder, entrons dans le Thank vif you, du sujet avec so notre premier thème, donc l'emploi. Moving on, we're going to par la look at le chômage de jobs masse, now. Dans Europe, dans the European Union has been hit by Severe economic stagnation, we've got 12% mass unemployment and um, we are facing serious problems, more than 50% youth unemployment in some countries. What can we do faced with this? When we speak about the single market, we speak about 500 million citizens, consumers. We speak about 22 million companies, a large percentage of which are SMEs. And we, but what we've seen is that the, in the past the common market, the single market has been perfect for the large-scale enterprises, the minority, and so we want to bring the single market closer to European citizens. We are trying to create an environment which is more favourable to European consumers. I'm not going to come here and say everything is effective because at the moment this isn't completely operational. The single market is all of the economy, it's jobs, it's 
It's a plank. It's, and if we fracture this, it won't be effective if we take this plank and make it more solid to, for all, we, together with citizens, with states, with state representatives, with company representatives, it will be much more efficient. So with my fellow commissioners, we are trying to reduce the fracture in this plank. But you can't deny that there's a loss of confidence in the single market. And we have even seen delocalization at the heart of the European Union and a lot of citizens don't think that the single market is working in their favor. We're not trying to do away with competition. We're not going back to an administrated economy from the Soviet Union or another such administration. We're trying to ensure there's no social dumping, that there's no tax dumping, fiscal dumping. And the process that we started 60 years ago has still not finished. Perhaps we need a social base and a stronger tax base as well in Europe to have a fully successful single market. So we are not we are trying to make competition as fair as possible. That is the objective. We will have states and companies who make things happen, who change, who invest here or there. And we, our role is to ensure that the rules are respected. Thank you. We're now going to have our first question from our social media sites. Well, yes, we've had quite a few messages about um, certificates and qualifications. And so on our social media site, we um, have a question coming to the commissioner now. Would it be possible to create an automatic system for recognizing qualifications on an EU level? This is already widely the case. If we look at the first advantages, the first benefits of Erasmus, which has been extremely successful, there are around 20 million students every year who go abroad to study. We are going to broaden this program to young professionals, to apprentices to interns. There is already wide mutual recognition of qualifications. But what we want to do here in Strasbourg is to look at education systems, which remain national education systems. We can't fuse everything, bring everything together for one single uniform Europe. It, we aren't in a uniform Europe. And if we try and do this, people will feel a loss of identity. They will feel that they are losing their roots and their traditions. So we don't want a single educational system. We have 28 in Europe. And what we can do is encourage exchanges between universities, between different training centers, different research centers, and there we will have mutual recognition. So we do have various different education systems in the EU. Will this actually be possible? Whether or not that's desirable, I think every country has to keep their identity with their own education system system just as their own language because this is one key pillar of their identity. We don't want a uniform Europe. We don't have one single European people, one single European nation. There are 28 European nations. There are 20 official languages. And so we have to, what we have to do is bring together these different nationalities. And that it's a complicated issue. It's not simple. If it's simple, it's uniform. This community or federation of 28 nation states needs to have uh, national identities fed in to be successful. So, as I said, we've had the Single Market Month with all of your contributions coming in, and we have invited five speakers here, and I'm going to pass the floor now to the first speaker. Bonjour, Monsieur le Commissaire. Mon nom est Martine Mas. Good afternoon, Je Commissioner. Belgique. My name is Martine Mas. I'm from Belgium and I work for Forum, which is a special society for training and education. A lot of young people are um, doing internships nowadays, and they're very useful now, can argue with that. But we would like to develop the opportunities for more internships with our neighboring countries in um, the Netherlands and so on. But there's not yet a European system for all of these internships. And I wanted to ask what your thoughts are on the subject. Do you think we should have a European framework for this? There is one example. We've just heard this idea from Martin that we should bring out into the debate this framework. We have to look into the feasibility of doing this, the technical feasibility for 
in terms, and we've already taken some steps forward in a directive which has just been adopted here amongst the Parliament in terms of creating a professional framework. We have recognized the quality of Inter internships in pr the professional domain. And what, we, what you are saying, what you want to do is to go further, to promote exchanges that can be done bilaterally. I think there are nations who between themselves have agreements, have cross-borders agreements to welcome interns. So I don't know if we do really need a uh, European framework. Erasmus is growing and it has an increased budget to promote internships or studies over one year for young professionals. So we are already moving in this direction. There is a directive that will be discussed tomorrow by heads of states which is the program that France has contributed to to promote contracts for young people. 7 billion euros have been invested to encourage support for each of the training of young people. This is trying to help those who are unemployed, who are finding problems, and one way of doing this could be internships. We but we will look into facilitating internships between countries. You were talking about mobility for interns, but there's also the issue of pay here, and that has come up across the um, debates this month. Should we ban non-paid internships? I think it's logical to impose minimum pay, but when we speak about a rule across the board, I don't think there could be a single European minimum wage. Every country has their own minimum wage. But for internships, for a young worker, it, whatever their qualifications, it is legitimate that they should be paid. Personally, I can't bring this before the commission. I can bring this before the commission. We can discuss about us, but we think this is logical that there could be, there should be pay for internships in country. Thank you, Marie. Any new questions coming in on our social media sites? Yes, I would like to invite everybody watching to please keep contributing. Use hashtag Ask Barnier, hashtag Ideas on Europe. Um, a lot of web users are worried about the lack of a European private company statute. They would like to see one created so that they can use it. Are there any projects which are working towards that? Where are we at this point? We're not very far down the road because this statute has to respect private companies. There have been proposals, but they have been blocked for many years. The Council of Ministers have looked into issues, for example, in Germany with the participation of employees in co-management. But we haven't overcome the roadblocks in, on this subject, and sometimes we have then suspended the, this debate to look into other areas. We have to look at reinforced cooperation, and it's difficult to do that without a country behind you, a big country like Germany, who's a big contributor to the single market. There can be measures taken, for example, in the area of accounting and accounting legislation. And we are working on other statutes which do not prevent national statutes. For example, the possibility of having a passport for all of Europe. We are working on statutes for mutual savings banks. We're working on different statutes on accessing the single market without barriers, without conflicting with national infrastructure. To go more in-depth into your question, this has been blocked by the, by the Council of Ministers and we haven't been able to move forward. We're now going to pass over to our second speaker. I'd like to thank you. Please present your idea and your question. Hello, Mr. Barnier. 
I am Marvin Kalani, coming from Bremen, Germany, working as a software developer and want to present you my idea. Crowdfunding for European projects to give all citizens the chance to participate in European projects. Crowdfunding is the possibility to raise money from people that like your idea by selling them products, profit shares, or benefits before the project starts. So here are my questions to you. Will it be possible for a citizen to invest in a European project? Could you imagine spending money for an internet-based crowdfunding platform for the European projects? And could you also imagine creating a market for shares for these projects? Uh, if, you, if I may switch to French and answer to, to your question. Uh, my answer is yes. Je pense que, uh, je pense que le crowdfunding a un avenir. I think the crowdfunding Donc, does have a future. Uh, uh, des and so I have opened public consultations formule, on this new, I could say, formula for those who are listening, crowdfunding participative direct financing between citizens which use internet platforms to get projects out into, into the public domain to request financing to finance a private or collective project and for savers, for investors to come into these projects and invest in, in, in them. So I do believe that these do have a future as long as they guarantee security. I'm currently working on a European framework to provide a framework for crowdfunding, to guarantee that the platforms that bring in investors, citizens over the internet are serious, are transparent and are operated with good management. But I think this is a good formula, but what can we understand by a European project in this area? We have to... We cannot finance the platforms themselves or buildings, but we can promote this area of the economy. We can finance it in the area of agriculture, for example. Already there is a lot of funding going out to these projects in this way. C'est euh, l'entrepreneuriat social, c'est euh, le, le social business, euh, c'est For the first time, the Commission is starting to look at supporting social business, a solidarity economy, a social economy. It's the first time that these new companies, these new ways of managing companies in a more participative, different, ethical way are looking to redistribute their profits more equally among shareholders. This is opening a new chapter. Here in Strasbourg in January, we attended a large conference on the social economy to look at what we've done over the last three years. We have done a lot in this area. And hopefully we will turn over a new page on supporting these new forms of companies and these new forms of financing, such as crowdfunding. But this isn't going to happen overnight. It's a long-term project. We've already made social entrepreneurs something very concrete, and we are voting for new funds which will be able to provide European financial frameworks. We have this passport I've spoken about. We have presented statutes. De toutes ces formes d'entreprises nouvelles en Europe. And we are taking note of all of these new forms of companies that are emerging within Europe. On a déjà fait des choses, ça suffit pas. We have already made some progress. We haven't done enough. But what's happening here in Strasbourg is that crowdfunding is here present in this society, and it's developing more quickly in some countries than others. So we have to promote exchange of good practice. Michel Barnier, we're now going to move on to our second topic from jobs now onto social rights. So with the crisis and following austerity policies, European citizens sometimes think that their social rights are being undermined. And the, do you think the Commission's austerity policies may have undermined these social rights? 
Pourquoi il y a de l'austérité Pourquoi il y a des efforts qui sont Why is there austerity Why are measures being taken that sometimes hit some populations, some citizens very hard in countries such as Greece, Spain, Ireland, Portugal C'est parce qu'il y a eu une mauvaise gestion. It's because there has been bad management, because debt has been accumulated and debt has to be paid back. So I find it quite irresponsible that governments on the right and on the left, including in France, are lending to children. And that happens in some countries. They are not lending to young people for investing in their future infrastructure or research or education, but for commercial products, and that's not normal. And that's what we're paying for now. We, cannot, we must ensure that austerity doesn't kill growth. It shouldn't be badly adapted to the situation, but we do need to better manage public finance. And it's not Brussels, taking the example of France, which has not had a balanced budget since for the last 40 years. It's not Brussels that have asked it to do that. It's not Brussels that has made a country like France accumulate debt, which represents 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the GDP. In the country where I am a citizen, in France, we spend more on servicing debt every year than we do on education. So my response is to say that there is a reason behind these efforts that we are contesting. We need to make, we need to return accountability and responsibility to lending to children, for example. We cannot touch spending that concerns education, investment in the future, in infrastructure, in training and research. But in some countries there are measures of reducing deficit which will bear fruit in the long term, more slowly, and promote future expenditure in that way. Thank you. We're now quickly going to turn to our um, contributors here, our speakers, and she's going to present her idea and put forward her question to the Commissioner. Good evening, Mr. Barnier. My name is Sorina Donisa. I'm coming from Romania and I'm representing the Romanian Association of Temporary Work Agents. I would highly appreciate if European Commission would take in consideration the idea of simplifying the procedures for working abroad by using a simpler and a common set of documents in each EU country. So my question for you is, what are the specific action that European Commission intends to undertake in order to increase the labor force mobility by using this simple set of documents. Un document unique européen. Il y a euh, une très grande marge de simplification possible. There is a lot of room for maneuver where we can simplify in Europe. Moins de bureaucratie, moins I think we need less bureaucracy, less regulation and more politics, more policy on a European level. That's what I feel as a European commissioner. So when we speak about mobility, because your question concerns mobility of workers, of citizens in Europe, it's a very sensitive issue at the moment. In many countries, we're talking about laws which already exist, laws on freedom of circulation, which are semi-unrestricted. For example, we cannot go to a country if we don't have a proof that we will return within three months. Then there are more long-term instances where citizens can stay in a country as long as they respect the laws and regulations in these countries and conform to minimum social obligations and benefit from their social rights as a result. And then there are other rules on temporary work, for example. So what we can, and they, these are all within national jurisdictions, what we can work on is simplifying and ensuring that obligations are respected, that these workers have their rights, that companies have their rights and people globally enjoy their rights within the European Union. We are aware that there are abuses of these rights. There are companies which prevent 
uh, which violate rights in their own interests. There are those who violate temporary work. There are laws that do not respect this posting of employees abroad, for example. And so we have to promote simplification and promote that these are respected with a framework that's stronger, that has more controls. And there, I think there is a lot of room for maneuver for simplification, as you've said. For example, speaking about companies, I've put forward, for example, a law on, on procurement so that states, companies, individuals, these represent 18% of the GDP. They're very important for the economy, and so this is a very complicated issue. There are some com small companies, for example, who do not, who not respond to European calls for tender because it costs too much. So we really do have to look into simplifying, for example, European regulations on calls for tender. We also heard about the question of documents needed for mobility. We're trying to do this with a professional car card which will promote the mobility of professionals in this way. Oui. Thank you. Okay. Any contributions uh, from you, Marie? Yes, on social rights, um, we had one idea raised for minimal social standards and norms to protect fundamental rights, but also to improve services, um, for example, social security services and health services. What would you say to that idea on the idea of minimal social standards? I think we need to, need to go beyond what we have at the moment with a tax and social base, and we need to move that forward. To wipe out abuses, we need competition in the single market. It's part of our life. These students here in Strasbourg who study management, uh, competitors within their same training course, companies compete for their market share, but we need to ensure that we have fair competition, and this isn't always the case. Yes, I do think we do need to go into this in this direction of strengthening our social base. We've seen this in Germany in some sectors with minimum wages, for example, and this is all fed into the debate. And we need to go further than what exists already, but we're not speaking about nothing when we talk about what already exists. There are regulations that come into play in terms of dialogue, social dialogue in companies, in hygiene, in health and safety, which have to be respected across the board, and it's that that is the heart of the matter. We have seen a distortion of some of the texts, for example, on the deployment of workers abroad. And we need to ensure that the rules in place are fully respected. You mentioned fundamental rights and also the balance between protection of rights and a competitive market. What do you understand under this concept? I can explain this by imposing another model that we have sometimes privileged over the last 30 years, which is the ultra-liberal model. This consists of opening all of the doors or, or windows, deregulating everything. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but it has caused an absolute catastrophe. Deregulation has been too liberal. It's caused the scandals surrounding bank defaults, surrounding bailouts, surrounding the social crisis which has ensued. Some bankers have taken bonuses when they have taken huge risks that have not paid off. So, but we are talking about something else when we talk about the single market. We're talking about competition within markets, with everyone in Europe having a social bake, a system for social protection and fair distribution. And so we are moving towards this social economic model, which is still competitive, of course. But nobody is going to let us lead the way, not the Chinese, not the Americans, and so we have to remain competitive. 
There can be no sustainable economic performance without social cohesion within companies and within society, and I think that has to be the basis for our neoliberal model. Do you have other questions coming in? Yes, I would like to remind everybody, please do keep sending in your questions with the hashtag AskBarnier, and please use our euronews.com website to send in contributions as well. So we've had some messages from people who are concerned about pensions. Is there a chance that pension funds are going to be centralized on a European level? The pension system is quite similar to the education system. It does pertain to national bases, national traditions, customs, differences. And I don't think we have to make everything uniform. There are countries such as my country who have chosen to privilege a certain system. They have cho chosen to follow through with their pension systems, which are working well. They're working well for their professionals. Sometimes there are state-supported, sometimes there are private systems, sometimes there are, there are mixed systems. And every country has to look into what it can do to ensure the viability and the sustainability of its pension system. I don't really support putting everything together in one melting pot, fusing everything together and making it all uniform. I think we have to respect national pension systems, whether the system that's in place in France, for example, whether private professional pension funds, whether seeing retirement at, as the end of the road. So... I have seen some modest measures which can be and careful measures which can be taken to ensure that there is sustainable financing for pensions that savings can be used to finance pensions so that there will indeed be pensions at the end of the at the end of the road. We have to privilege systems that work well and a lot of these professional systems work well. Throughout the single market month, we saw the topic of a central minimum European pension, which was much discussed. Do you think that this might be implemented? We already need, have minimums in every one of our country when we speak about the weakness of pensions for farmers in France, for example. They sometimes do not receive a dignity dignified income, 300, 500 euros per month when they've spent their entire lives working hard in the agricultural industry. But we cannot ask Brussels to do everything. Otherwise, we will reinforce this discourse against the bureaucracy in Brussels that wants no more borders, no more individuality, no more identity, that they want to deal with everything. But we can do more by favouring exchanges of good practice, cooperation, harmonisation and equivalence, rather than trying to make everything uniform. I don't reject this debate on a minimum pension income. Many, this is in place in many countries in in the United Kingdom, in Portugal, in Romania, and elsewhere. So we don't need an urgent debate to overhaul the system. What we need to do is to support social rights, to support a minimum revenue. We have to reinforce the social base at the heart of Europe. And one thing that unions are asking, calling for and governments haven't always listened to is social dialogue. And I believe in this European social dialogue. I believe that unions always have something intelligent and useful to say to better adapt our laws to the realities in the country. So I want to see more social dialogue in Europe. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to a third topic now, one which is very familiar to you. We're going to be talking about banks. So international finance has been seen to have simply gotten out of control recently. And what lessons has the EU learned from the crisis? I have my favorite table here. You don't need to look at the television to watch it. You might not be able to see it on the screen. But here we have 20 
bills that I have pre presented. No financial act, product, sector should be able to escape the public sector, and this document is available online. We hear sometimes that the citizens have been asked to do too much, to give too much to save the banks. We have to go further to implement the recommendations for the G20 following the crisis to create a base for financial markets. We need banks, we need finance. We need financial markets that work for the economy, not for themselves, as we have seen for a long time for the last 25 years. You're not alone there. 70% um, of the bailouts um, were being funded, as you said, and that wasn't the case everywhere. I've spoken about the global financial crisis coming from the United States, originating in the United States, and I've spoken about the G G20, where many heads of state came together to discuss these issues and to find measures to overcome. They did dem this was a demonstration in itself that this crisis is global. In Europe, we have to look at what we can do here with our la laws and our decisions taken following the G20. The Americans have done the same as of the Russians, the Chinese. Everyone has their own laws. And we have spent a lot of time looking at how we can constitute a level playing field, ensuring equality of treatment so that there's no unfair competition and discrimination. Globally, the United overall, the Americans, with 80% of our financial, with our trade, trade, are our main partners. Our transatlantic trade, rather, are our main partners, and we do need an equal, a level playing field so that our banks, our pension funds can be treated equally. Thank you. So how can European citizens um, resist these um, offers today? There may be more, con more crises that have more consequences, but we have to ensure we have policies that are coming into force now and are coming into force in 2014. There is a crisis. If there's a crisis now, we have done everything we can to avoid it. We have tried to calm the markets, and I believe we've started to do this over the last two years, because every country has taken the decision to better manage their public finance, which was an urgently needed measures with better governance of the eurozone and we have seen this governance come into action we've seen exactly what it constitutes so the problem of one country doesn't become the problem of all as was the case with Greece three years ago we've taken the rights decisions the laws are now coming into force and I can be clear on the fact that all of these laws that were voted in over the last four or five years have been limited to three or four cases of public bailouts of private banks. I'm not, I can't possibly say that there are never going to be any more crises. I cannot say that everything will be into place to deal with these because we need a lot of time to get things through the Council of Ministers, through the Parliament and for everything to be implemented. Democracy, after all, does not go as quickly as the financial markets, but we have tools in place to resist. So taxpayers were very concerned seeing their banks so weak, and we are going to have a full speaker here. Please put your question Hi, forward. Hi, Mr. Commissioner. Um, we need better banks. I'm from Denmark. My name is Kim Valentin. I've spent the last 20 years helping people understanding the financial market through my company. My idea is simply to rate the banks uh, by performance, by a, a smiley system. If uh, the banks doesn't uh, comply, they get a, a sad smiley. And the bank authorities already have this knowledge, so uh, it's quite easy to uh, impose. Uh, if we impose this uh, smiley system, uh, the good banks will gain trust and the uh, uh, people will choose the right banks. So, Mr. Commissioner, I have this question. How do you think a smiley system would affect the transparency in the bank system? I would like that all the banks in Europe, 8,000 banks, uh, will, will be able to, to get the smiley system. 
Mais je réponds en liant les deux questions. But at the same time, I'm going to answer the two questions. Everything that we are doing comes down to rules to ensure that the banks are better managed, that they have more capital reserves, they take less risks and can control these risks, and that are better managed and supervised. And these, this is why I wanted to show you the 20 measures on this paper. We've spoken about new reforms of the banking sector to better separate the risk system in the banking sector, with, whether with you working with companies, whether with speculation and investment. And I've also put forward a law which is very important by citizens, which has been supported by the Parliament and the Council of Ministers for transparency in banking expenditure, for basic bank accounting. Do you know today that 60 million Europeans don't have bank accounts, and 30 million of these want a bank account, want to open them. 9 million Europeans have been refused bank accounts. Not only people in great social difficulty, we've also seen Erasmus students being denied these bank accounts. This isn't right. We need a basic standard in all countries. And you, for example, mentioned one option, the Smiley system, which will ensure transparency in, in the different countries of Europe. I believe a lot in notation, but we have to look at whether we're looking at a bureaucratic or administrative system with distributing Smileys, I don't know. But even conservatives can put into place over the single market a system supporting, supported by the rules that we have created, obligations for transparency with banking expenses. To, we could create this smiley system. Why not? We need to take legislative measures which are going to benefit consumers rather than creating more bureaucratic measures in the banking system. Mary, I think we have a question on Twitter. Yes, they were talking about the 60 million Europeans who don't have a bank account, and they want to know what the banks themselves could do to try and better serve society and consumers. I have just said I have presented this text before the Parliament. I hope it will be voted through before the end of this parliamentary session, before the election in May, so that we can make opening accounts obligatory. I want all banks to be obliged to open an account. We're not speaking about giving money to people. Even if they don't have a lot of money, they ha have to have an account, because what can I do without a bank account? I can't do a lot. I can't be paid my wages. I can't make purchases online. I'm ex becoming excluded from society. So not having a bank account as a European citizen is a factor for exclusion. And I've made this proposal making opening accounts in all countries obligation and promoting mobility between bank accounts. Sh it shouldn't be expensive to change banks. This often discourages people, and this isn't right. We need a comparison system so that we can know the reality of banking charges which are being charge to your account. It's in the banking union and how it's being developed, but the question which remains is exactly who will decide the fate of a bank if they fail or go bankrupt. Where are we with that? We're talking about bank resolution here. The resolution deals with default orders. Dealing with the problem is much, always a lot less expensive than reparation. But when we do have to provide reparation, when we get to a crisis point, reparation that has been prepared is also less expensive than impromptu reparation. So I've looked into a law for all 28 countries on banking resolutions 
which would be comme on vu, malheureusement, depuis, uh, six which six would ensure that banks are paid for by banks and not by taxpayers, which is one extremely important measure that we've spoken about. This will go to the vote in the next few weeks, and then to decide on the resolution, I have proposed that within the Eurozone, within the banking union, that there should be a European authority which can take resolutions, which gets feedback from banks so that when there is, so that they can order a default when there is no other option. But the banks would be paid for by the banks, not by the taxpayer. We would organize this default amongst the creditors and, and shareholders who are responsible for the banks so that it doesn't come back to the taxpayer. To avoid banks failing and defaulting, we have seen some measures, for example, Basel III, which have, try, which have tried to impose higher levels of equity and capital. What else can be done to regulate financial markets? That's not the only way of making banks more robust. There is external supervision. The ECB will directly supervise, perhaps together with national supervisory bodies, the 6,000 European banks. There are rules on capitalization, for example. For example, there are recommendations that there should be retained capital of 9%. Formerly, it was only 3%. But we have been told, the European leaders have been told that this isn't enough. In banking defaults in Ireland, in the UK and in other countries, we have seen that this wasn't enough. This is now the reality we are facing. Banks must have better capital stocks. They must be better, more robust and able to respond to their own, their own crises. And so we are looking into extra levels of capital that would need to be retained. That is a measure that could come into place in the future, but what I do believe is this arsenal of regulations, this architecture of regulations will make our banks more robust, more resilient. And we hope that this will prove true. If we have to consolidate some banks, they will be consolidated. And if that isn't enough, we will go further. But we've already taken a lot, a lot of positive steps in this area. Going to move on to our last topic now, e-commerce. Online commerce. Today, 60% of internet users in Europe do purchase online. Is that the case for you, Mr. Barnier? Not regularly. If I do need to buy something online, I will buy something online for train tickets, for example. But I don't find it very comfortable doing that when I'm in another country, for example. So I mainly do this for train tickets. Sometimes for the cinema. We saw that 312 billion euros had been produced by e-commerce, which is only 5% of all retail. So could um, e-commerce be a solution to the crisis? There is a potential for growth in the digital economy in general and in the single digital market that my colleagues are actively working on. Heads of state and government will meet, especially this week, on this subject for the first time taking special, looking at special measures, special decisions with Corp. And why don't we cooperate with Amazon, Google? Why don't we bring together the largest European telecommunications companies so that we can have a better network? We're going to spend tens of billions of European finances to increase access to network, networks, to make networks accessible to all SMEs and Internet users, wherever they are. So I think, yes, there is serious potential for growth in e-commerce. I don't know if your percentages are right, but there is potential for growth as long as we lift some concrete, serious roadblocks. For example, we have to ensure payment security. 30% of citizens, I don't know if this is the case amongst the sample that we have here, do not trust card payments giving a card number. 
because they can be they can be misused. So what we have to do is reinforce obligations and rules for banks for credit cards to ensure security. In the case of payments, that's the first thing we can do. Then we have the delivery of goods. This is one of the barriers that we are facing, but we I think we have a question which touches on this. I'm going to invite you to give us that contribution. Yes, we have Sebastian Camion on Twitter who said, I love shopping online with Amazon, but some people have been saying that Amazon is killing town centres. And is the EU really studying this impact of online shopping on town centres? We cannot mince our words. We have, to, we have to look at the time that we are living in. We don't only have to look at the networks that you have spoken about that are American. There are many other European companies which are selling online and which need to be supported. But this debate deals with pitting real commerce against e-commerce. And I think that the important thing is to maintain jobs, to maintain physical shops. But what is missing from this debate is that e-commerce allows a wider range of choice. It makes things more transparent. It allows comparisons. And it doesn't necessarily go hand in hand with a reduction in traditional commerce. Je suis également soucieux, au-delà du commerce électronique, est-ce qu'il y a un meilleur équilibre entre les petits commerces dont on a besoin et les grands Perhaps the question would be, is there a better balance between the large-scale platforms and the small countries? And this is one of the things we're looking into and trying to control and to bring under our management. Ou à mon interlocuteur, que de faire une étude. As to the question that we had from our internet user about studying the impact of e-commerce in terms of percentages, and perhaps we need to look at what is comparatively between traditional commerce and e-commerce, and I find this idea very interesting and will take that forward. Talking about obstacles and somebody complained about problems they'd had with delivery and delivery costs, which are sometimes 50% higher when the delivery goes into another country. And that was just one concern raised amongst others. So why, um, why does this affect e-commerce in Europe? An integrated e-commerce market in Europe, we have already moved forward with this. We have studied technical and administrative measures with many of the member states. On the topic of the quality and price of delivery, we have to look at the postage systems in all countries in Europe, and we've held consultations with them and also Australian and American partners who have decided to work together on this common European delivery market to lower the delivery costs, to ensure the security of delivery when products will get there, when they, to ensure the products will get with them, they have been ordered. And these will be, this will be a very useful tour. Operators are working together to draw up a common charter in the postage system in, in terms of a single market. I'll give you one example. There are different code bars compared uh, across different countries, and that really just slow down delivery. Rather than drafting a law, we are looking at portability of contracts of music, whether they can be transported in another country. So I've looked more into contracts than legislative constraints that can allow us to move much faster in this area, and it puts everything clearly on the table. I've encouraged this with music providers, with cinema providers, but also with postal systems. But if we draft a law, we can draft a law, rather, if we realize that this is not really moving, but there's something to take into account further down the line. Marie, back on uh, questions on e-commerce, we've had a question. Can we lift barriers which are blocking films? E-books and streaming. Could that be done? 
Things are already moving in this area. As I've spoken, of what we've already started working on this digital market with ministers of culture, amongst others, to dynamize the e-market for music, cultural products, etc. And one issue that's really at stake here amongst young people, amongst everyone, is intellectual property. We have to support everything that's been done technically by countries to increase the supply available. There is abundant supply at competitive prices, but we cannot encourage theft, piracy, which will come at the detriment of those who really do create, because creation, innovation, intellectual property, they represent millions of jobs in the branding office, in the patent office. That is one area that we have been able to move forward with the European patent for companies. When in Europe, Patents cost a lot more than elsewhere, which can be a barrier for companies. We have to look into this, but we have to be able to encourage e-commerce in the right way because we have millions of jobs at stake. We cannot accept that young people can steal or misuse intellectual property for nothing. So yes, we do have to promote mode streaming, we do have to promote fluidity within e-commerce, but in the right way. We're going to come to our last speaker here. Yeah, uh, hello, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, my name is Vera Maia. I come from Portugal and I work as an e-commerce specialist um, in a Portuguese jeanswear brand named Salsa. Uh, my idea is to lower uh, delivery taxes and shipping for online sales so we can improve e-commerce e e in the European Union. Um, and my question is, a few months ago, we heard about a free trade ag agreement between the US and EU. Um, and I would like to know when we can expect this agreement to be signed. Thank you. We have just initiated negotiations with the United States on what we call the TTIP. This is, the, this is a big free trade agreement that we're working on, and that's going to take time. I think we'll need at least a full year, if not three or two or three, before we, we've just signed the free trade agreement with Canada, and that also took a lot of time to push through. We do need an agreement to come about, an agreement that's win-win, so that everyone can benefit, and we're still not there. I heard President Obama when I was in Washington during his State of the Union speech, and when it came to this transatlantic free trade agreement, he said it must be free and fair. Fair, free, and balanced. We're not there. We're not there with trade relations with the United States, with China. We're a lot more open than they are, and so we have to work so that this transatlantic agreement that I believe is necessary, that I would support, is open but also fair. The, the key is in the detail. There are a lot of chapters that are very complicated, but we hope to get there in one or two years. So, Michel Barnier, we're coming to the end of our program and our debate. And what are you going to do with all of these ideas? Will they be taken uh, on in the next commission? We need time to draft propositions, to look into the impact of the positive impact the public consultations can have. Probably the good ideas that are here and here, we've heard some very good ideas shared by the participants here, and I thank them for these ideas. I'm now going to look into them. My colleagues are going to look into them because there are around a dozen commissioners to ensure that we can make the single market work well or at least work better. We're going to look into them straight away. We're going to look into their feasibility. It will be the commission there that will be sitting until October 2014 before 
a changeover. They will look into the feasibility and they will work on these areas and see if we can take them forward. And of course, we can't forget to mention the European elections, which will take place in seven months. So Eurosceptics look like they're gaining ground. What can we do to breathe fresh life into the European ideal? There's no fatality in the fact that Eurosceptics are perhaps gaining ground. We often speak about fatalism, about severe pessimism, and we cannot afford to do this as, citizens, as European citizens, as politicians. We have to act, we have to change things. If Europe isn't convenient for us, we change it. There are many changes that, has to, that have to be done to ensure full satisfaction. But I cannot accept discourse where we say that we should fold in on ourselves, we should close off everyone for themselves, put, put back up the solid borders. We have to look at the world as it is. We have China, United States, Russia, Brazil, India. These are countries that don't need anyone. They have so large populations, so many resources, but they, and they are sitting at the table of the big global actors. We want to be there at the table with them. We don't want to be sitting back looking on. We want to ensure that we are there at the table, as well as being a patriot, as well as being Portuguese, Belgian, Italian, Slovenian, Polish. In addition, rather than in place of... In addition, we have to be European and we have to be actively European. And what we have to do to respond to fear, to respond to doubt, we have to come out of the crisis. We have to promote, promote growth. We have to promote, encourage jobs, produce more jobs, and we have to open public debate. That's what we have to do. Very quickly, something that's new here is that every European party is going to put forward their own candidate for the presidency of the Commission. Do you think that giving this uh, human face is going to get people back to the balance? I'm trying to do my job well here today, so I can't say anything else. What I'm encouraging is participation in public debates for 2014. Myself, where I'm at, I represent the European People's Party, which is looking into this question. This, I, if I can be useful, I will enter into the debate as I can, as a patriot and as a European citizen. I do think this is a good idea. I think it's a good idea to bring a human face to the Commission before the elections and during the elections and then beyond. We said this around 10 years ago. European citizens will elect a national representative for each country and then vote for someone to become the president of the Commission. I hope there will be more participation than we've seen before. I hope this will be much more democratic. We'll see you involved there, maybe. Well, that's the end of our single market programme. Thank you to all the participants here today and to everybody who contributed online. And thank you to our audience here from the Strasbourg School of Management. And a big thank you to you, Michel Barnier, for coming here to answer to our questions. I would just like to remind everyone that you can look at this program under www.euronews.com. Thank you very much.